So, uh, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, depending on uh, where where you are. Uh, this is Crosby Kemper, the director of the uh, Institute of Museum and Library Services, the IMLS. Uh, welcome. Uh, we've had uh, uh, an overwhelming uh, response uh, to today's webinar, so I want to get right into it, but I'll mention now, and I may mention later, uh, we are recording this. Uh, if uh, colleagues, friends, uh, other members of uh, your communities uh, didn't have a chance to get in or if you uh, need to leave uh, at some point, this will be available on our website. Uh, Log Me In is doing this for us and we'll be linking to them uh, from imls.gov. I think the Department of Education may also link to it and eventually uh, we will actually have this up on our website uh, as well. Uh, the, the IMLS uh, is an independent federal agency located in uh, Washington, D.C. We're best known for our, our grants uh, to museums and libraries, uh, but part of our mission uh, is to support innovation and ideas to do research and policy development. This, of course, fits into all of that, as well as uh, the Institute uh, has been uh, requested by the White House and Congress to be a part of the all hands on deck emergency response uh, to our uh, national uh, crisis. Uh, and uh, we know that information is a key to what all of you do, and it's a key to what we do. And we're pleased today in uh, association with our uh, partners in presenting this webinar, the Department of Education, uh, represented by Phil Rosenfeld, the National Archives, uh, represented by Gary Stern, Smithsonian Institution, Judith Leonard, and the Library of Congress, uh, Elizabeth Pugh. Also want a shout out to our own general counsel, Nancy Weiss and Amanda Bacall. Um, uh, I'm gonna introduce in uh, one second, uh, David Berendis uh, and Catherine Raspberry, Dr. David Berendis and Dr. Catherine Raspberry from the CDC. Uh, but first of all, I, before, before we do that, I want to thank all of you for what you're doing. Uh, the, the, uh, the virtual uh, world that you inhabit now, that we're all inhabiting uh, now, is still providing education, enlightenment, uh, uh, entertainment uh, to a world desperately in need of it, and, and, and lifeline to the rest of the world. And, and so what you're doing is enormously important. And if we can help you with information today uh, about your collections, uh, about your materials, uh, about your uh, future uh, activities. Um, we want to continue to do that. So look look for us to develop uh, uh, not only the a link to, to this webinar, but to uh, further information. And the CDC has uh, promised us that they'll continue to let us uh, uh, mediate uh, uh, for them uh, to uh, the library and museum and archive worlds. So today we've got Dr. David Berendis, who is a, a, an epidemiologist in the Waterborne Disease Prevention Branch uh, of the CDC, who focuses on global sanitation and hygiene uh, issues. And Dr. Catherine Raspberry, who is a health scientist in the CDC's Division of Adolescent and uh, School Health. Um, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to uh, Dr. Raspberry uh, to start, and then Dr. Berendis. And as I say, we'll be taking questions. Uh, and we have a list of questions that I'll refer to after their presentations, but we're taking your questions online. If you look at the question box, um, uh, you can, you can uh, send your question that way, um, and we'll try and get to as many as we can. So, uh, Dr. Raspberry, take it away. All right, thank you so much. So, um, as he mentioned, my name is Catherine Raspberry, and my uh, usual job is in CDC's Division of Adolescent and School Health, but right now I'm helping with our Community Guidance Development Team, which is part of a Community Interventions Task Force in our response efforts. And I've been really focused on um, some of the guidance for a variety of settings across the community and certainly our museums and our libraries are a critical setting. So I wanna first mention where you can find guidance that I think you will find most relevant uh, for your organizations. So right now we have guidance documents, I think three specific ones that will be of interest to you. So if you have a pen in your hand, you may wanna jot these down. We have some guidance that's developed for community and faith-based organizations. 
We have some guidance around large community events and mass gatherings. And we have some guidance around business and employers. And I think you're sort of crossing all those different areas in the work that you do most likely. And so those are key places where you'll find information from CDC on uh, recommendations for addressing COVID-19 in your uh, facility and in your work. So that's a sort of a starting point for you. I want you to know where you can find the information that I'm about to talk about. So everything we're discussing is sitting in those documents on our website, so you'll be able to look there for more information. So today, I wanna really focus on a few key things. We're gonna start by talking about the importance of looking at any existing emergency operations plans. Then we're gonna move into talking about preventive actions and how you can help promote those in your facility, with your staff, and with your guests. And we'll talk about social distancing as well. So we'll get into some specifics around social distancing and what you can do to help with that. We'll also talk briefly about the importance of thinking about groups at high risk for complications from COVID-19 across all those different pieces. And then my colleague David is gonna be able to speak to you more about some of the cleaning and disinfection related guidance. And I know folks had a lot of specific questions in that area, so it'll be super helpful to hear from him. All right, so let me start by kind of the beginning of things. I think one of the most important things for you to do at this stage, if you haven't already, and you may have, is to think about looking at your emergency operations plans. If you have these plans, pull them out, dust them off. Um, I'm guessing many of you have done that already. And keep in mind that your primary point of contact and your first stop always is gonna be the local health officials in your own community. We really think it's critical that you make sure you have ways to communicate effectively with the health department in your area. So that's local health department, potentially state health department as well. You may be doing that through um, like a library system leadership team or through your local government or other folks within your structure. Um, or organization, but they're gonna be critical for you to help you understand um, what types of strategies are most appropriate given the level of community transmission where you are. Another thing that's important and may be covered in your emergency operations plans is thinking about your sick leave policies. So not only do you serve a community, you also serve as an employer in many cases. and uh, you wanna look at your sick leave policies so that you can be in encouraging telework when it's possible. I certainly understand that not every staff member has a job that's appropriate for teleworking, but some may, so encourage that when you can. Um, think about special considerations for your staff at high risk. So we know that some individuals, specifically older adults and individuals with underlying conditions are at higher risk for severe complications of COVID-19. And so it's particularly important that you think about these staff and you think about ways you may be able to accommodate them to help protect them. And finally, in your sick leave policies, um, one of the things you wanna look for is to make sure that you have some flexibility to allow your staff to stay home when they're sick or if they're caring for sick family members. One of the most important things that we want all people doing right now is to stay home when they're sick. That includes your guests, that includes your employees, right? We don't want people coming out into the community when they're sick. Um, as you're looking at your emergency operations plans, I would also encourage you to make any updates that you need to. So make sure that you have contact information for all your employees. Make sure that you have plans in place to think about how you're gonna communicate both with your employees as well as your community members at large. So if you decide to implement changes to your services or to your hours, or if you're closing your facility, all those things you need to be able to communicate effectively and efficiently with the people that you serve. We also want you to think about multiple ways to disseminate information. And you likely do this all already, and you can likely use systems that you currently have in place for communicating with your community. So you may use uh, website information, you might have phone trees or uh, call numbers that you can use or mailings that you can use as well. And one of the other really important pieces in your emergency operations plan is gonna be um, some of the pieces that you have around cleaning and disinfection. Now, I'm gonna pause and not talk about that here 
because David's going to be telling us more about that in just a few minutes. So those are some kind of overarching principles to think about in your emergency operations plan. So make sure you have a contact with your health department. You know who you'll reach out to and how. Make sure you have uh, appropriate sick leave policies that really allow your employees to not be at work when they're sick or if they have to care for people who are sick. And make sure that you have updated ways to communicate effectively with both your employees and the people that you serve. Now, another really important thing that you can do is to help promote preventive actions. So this can happen in a couple of ways. I think one broad way is that you can share information with people about important preventive actions. So when we say that in general, we're talking about things like hand hygiene. So for example, we want everyone to be washing their hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds especially after at, at these key times, like after going to the bathroom or before they eat or after they blow their nose or cough or sneeze. We want people to know that if uh, they can't access soap and water and as long as their hands are not visibly dirty, they should be using an alcohol-based hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol. So you can help communicate some of this just basic information to help people take care of themselves. You can promote that through your communication channels. You can also display it in your facility. So in your restrooms, maybe you put up signs to remind people to wash their hands and to do it for 20 seconds, right? Um, CDC has a variety of resources that you can use for this. We have some printable signs and posters, and we have the links to those sitting in the guidance that I mentioned um, a few minutes ago. We also want people to be using cough etiquette, so covering their coughs or sneezes with a tissue and then immediately throwing that into the trash. We want to remind people not to touch their eyes, nose, and mouth. Generally speaking, again, we want them, as I mentioned a minute ago, staying home when they're sick, keeping physical distance from people. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. But again, reminding your staff, reminding your visitors, um, through both written communications that you provide as well as prompts and signs, things like that in your facility to help people remember in the moment to participate in those preventive actions. It's also critical that you think about what they're gonna need to be able to do that. So for example, they can't wash their hands if there's not soap in the bathrooms, right? Um, so you may want to more clearly point people to the restroom facilities and certainly make sure that you're stocked up on the supplies that you need to support these preventive actions. So soap, drying materials, tissues where guests can find them, trash cans nearby, that sort of thing. All right, let's talk a little bit briefly here about social distancing. So that's certainly one of the things that we're recommending people do to protect themselves and others. Um, and as a museum or a library, you'll find yourself needing to think about the types of activities that you typically offer and really thinking critically about which of those activities or services put people in close proximity to one another. As you think about that, you'll then think about how to alter or reduce or suspend services or activities so that you can help ensure that everyone in your facility has appropriate physical distance between each other. And what we're going for here is six feet. The goal is to put six feet between all people and in particular people from different households, right? So for example, we've seen some um, folks in library communities, as an example, do this already. I know that some of my local libraries have had virtual story times for children, particularly since so many of them are out of school right now. Well, learning from home right now. Um, it may be that you typically have classes or speakers in your facility, and some of those activities could be potentially transitioned to online settings. Remember that at times when your facility is open, you may want to think about what you can do in your physical space to help encourage that distancing. So, for example, you might think about moving out some of the chairs at reading tables so that chairs are six feet apart, or move tables so that they're six feet apart. So Really what we want you to do is think about the guidance that we have right now about these key principles, such as social distancing, and then think critically and creatively about how you can make those things work in your own facility and how you can make it easier for your staff and your guests to be implementing those key principles. 
We also know that as part of social distancing, it may be that you see additional interest in some of your online services. So for example, electronic lending or some of these virtual story times or virtual book clubs or speakers. And so you'll also wanna plan for that potential increase in that online traffic and the interest in some of these online support services. In terms of gatherings, I think most of you are probably aware that the president recently issued some guidance to help slow the spread. It was originally 15 days to slow the spread. That has now been extended through April 30th. And in that guidance, they're recommending avoiding all social gatherings of less than 10 people. I think that's a good thing to keep in mind as you think about activities within your own facility. Um, and always remember that your local health officials are gonna be the people who are best positioned to offer guidance on what you should do in terms of gathering. So when to postpone, when to restart, when to cancel, or again, when to sort of resume that if, you, if you've been canceled uh, or had those canceled for a while. So your local health officials are really gonna be key partners in all of your decision-making. Um, I think another thing to keep in mind is partic pa particularly as people are in your facility, you will want to think about having a plan for what to do if someone is symptomatic or becomes symptomatic. And again, we have some more specific guidance about this that you'll find on our website, you know, in our guidance materials, but you will want to um, have a way to isolate them. So you may need a designated space um, to make sure that they can be separate from other individuals in your facility until they can go home. And ideally, you don't want them going home using public transportation, right? So you have to think about that as well. So that should be an important part of your planning process and thinking about how you may be able to physically remove someone who may have, well, that sounded a little harsh, but separate someone who may have uh, symptoms or become symptomatic when they're in your facility. I think the other piece I wanna mention related to social distancing is that um, a lot of what I've mentioned so far is about your guests right, the people that you serve in your community. But you can also think about this from the perspective of being an employer. So for example, think about how offices are set up and is there a way to increase the space between employees if they are having to come into the facility? Again, certainly encouraging telework where that's possible. Even if folks are in your facility, you may think about having meetings via phone or video conferences. Just because they're all in the same building does not mean they need to gather in the same room. So there are a lot of things, smaller things like this that you can do to help make sure that even if your employees are at work, that they are able to keep appropriate physical distance between each other. You may even think about the physical configuration of different locations within your facility. So I'm thinking like a, a check-in or a check-out center um, and think about if there are ways to put not only more space between your employees, but more physical space between your employees and your visitors. All right, so those are really some key principles there. I think the idea of looking at your emergency operations plans, promote, promoting preventive actions, and thinking about social distancing kind of across all the settings. And across all three of those things, we want you to always be thinking about any extra accommodations you might need to make for people who are in that high risk group. Again, that's older adults and um, individuals who may have uh, other underlying medical conditions. So across everything you're doing, think about those folks and what you could do to further protect them um, if appropriate. All right, so I think that sums up what I wanted to cover in some of the key principles in our guidance. And I wanna turn it over now to my colleague, David, who is gonna speak more about some of the cleaning and disinfection questions that I know folks have had. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so my name is David Brandes. Uh, in my home office, I work in the waterborne disease prevention branch um, as an epidemiologist in global low-income settings, as well as I serve as um, both domestically and globally as the hand hygiene um, reference point for community settings within the agency. So, um, and within the within the response, I'm actually working as the team lead of the water sanitation and hygiene team within the same task force as Catherine, that's the Community Interventions Task Force. And so 
Um, a lot of the work that we have been doing is around both hand hygiene as well as environmental cleaning and disinfection. And I really want to touch on the main points of the environmental cleaning and disinfection work uh, that we've been doing. Um, so if I give you any point today, the main point is uh, clean and disinfect your high touch surfaces. That's the main takeaway I want everyone to get. Um, that's the main focus that a lot of our guidance is built around, and that's the principle you'll see, hear me come back to a lot as I talk you through some of the guidance. Now, um, similar to Catherine, our guidance is uh, on, on the website in a few places, and primarily you're going to want to look for guidance that we've developed for community non-healthcare organizations. So we've basically separated out our guidance for environmental cleaning and disinfection into households, and then community non-healthcare organizations. And so the community non-healthcare organizations um, are, di are divided into uh, those that are have, have notes for those that house and those that don't house people overnight. Um, but all of the, a lot of that guidance still applies. And so um, I will be able to send out those links as well, but I'll walk you through some of that guidance. Um, certainly, uh, just to get a couple definitions down, when I'm talking about cleaning, I'm talking about cleaning with um, a detergent or soap and water, something that's going to remove, you know, dirt, visible dirt, soil, things like that. Disinfecting is going to be me talking about use of an actual disinfectant, um, something that will kill the residual virus or germs um, that are present. So just to be clear on those definitions as well. So in terms of your routine day-to-day -day activities, um, we're suggesting uh, continuing to, and in some cases, um, if you feel necessary, um, increasing the frequency of routine cleaning of hard non-porous surfaces that are frequently touched. So the hard surfaces like your railings, your doorknobs, faucets, uh, light switches, things like that, those are going to be the surfaces that people uh, touch the most and they're also the surfaces that the virus could survive on longest. So we'd like you to clean and disinfect those uh, regularly. Again, the good news is that this virus is extremely susceptible to many of the typical disinfectants that your staff are already probably using. So while I'm going to give you a reference for a list as well of um, products that are approved by the EPA for use against coronaviruses, you'll find that that list is essentially many of the common household and commercial disinfectants you're already using. So this is not a super virus that survives for extremely long periods and is very resistant to disinfectants, quite the opposite. It's actually quite susceptible to most of our common disinfectants like bleach and alcohols and other, other things that you're used to using in your own household. So I wanna put everyone at, at ease there um, as well. So our guidance, um, so in, in kind of in preparatory setting, we're suggesting that, you know, do this sort of um, routine cleaning and disinfection at least once a day if you can, um, and perhaps more often if you're able to based on the feasibility. Um, we're then also dividing out our guidance and saying, if you have a case, what should you do? So if someone shows up and uh, is symptomatic, or if you're concerned uh, and you find that you have a case of COVID-19 in your facility, what, what should you do at that point? At that point, we suggest uh, closing off the area where the individual was most using. Um, so if it was one of your staff, perhaps, and they have an office, mainly the area where they were mainly mainly working that day, um, close that off for as long as is practical, ideally up to 24 hours if you can. Um, that 24 hours is not to scare anyone at all. It's primarily to allow for any respiratory uh, droplets that would be in the air to settle out. And the reason why it's so long and that may seem very long is because uh, when we were developing this guidance, we were developing it for very generally all community settings. And so we had to be sort of overly cautious. In most library settings, your air exchanges and the, the rate at which you have ventilation, things like that, is gonna be much quicker than say a stagnant car, which is kind of our worst case example where the air is just kind of sitting there. Um, and so, you know, it will be much, probably be much shorter than 24 hours, but if possible, close off the area where that individual was for up to 24 hours. Um, you can open doors and windows to help ventilation, just help that, help the air move throughout and get the air exchange going. Um, and then after that period, 
then your janitorial staff can go in and clean and disinfect the frequently touched surfaces, especially, but if you can, all surfaces. Um, in terms of the surfaces for hard non-porous surfaces, um, clean them with any sort of detergent or soap and water, and then use a EPA registered household disinfectant that are available on the EPA website under list N. Um, those are their disinfectants that are effective against uh, this particular, the virus that causes COVID-19. Um, however, again, this is a virus that is very susceptible to typical EPA registered household disinfectants. So we also include guidance on our website and as to how to make diluted bleach solutions, as well as um, guidance on uh, use of other solutions like at least 70% alcohol solutions for electronics. For soft or porous surfaces like carpeted floors or rugs or drapes, um, if there's any visible contamination there, you can clean those off um, and then you can launder them if possible or try to find an appropriate, uh, an appropriate product for that particular surface. For soft or porous surfaces, we are not as concerned about those in terms of their transmission just because the virus doesn't survive for as long and it's really hard to uh, you, it's very hard to, to sort of have a contact or get the virus out of that surface. Once it's in a fabric, um, it's probably going to die off there. It's not going to re aerosolize and get into an individual's lungs at that point. So we're really not concerned about that. Um, and for similar reasons, I know a question many of you are concerned about, we are not concerned at all about um, paper based materials like books being a transmission route. Um, in fact, in, we've been encouraging in our conversations with election officials, we encourage mail-in voting, um, and we're not concerned about mail or letters at all as, um, as a source of transmission at this point. So again, for paper-based products, we're really not um, concerned, and you don't have to really worry about finding ways to disinfect those materials. The virus, if it's present, would be present in very low quantities and would, would die off pretty quickly. For electronics, um, we are suggesting definitely to think about disinfecting those because those tend to be high touch. Um, those should be disinfected with either a product approved by the manufacturer or if there is no product available that or no manufacturer's guidance you can find, consider the use of alcohol-based wipes or sprays that contain at least 70% alcohol. In terms of, and my final point would be around personal protective equipment that your janitorial staff would need. Because of the fact that we're asking people to sort of wait in some of these in, in these areas before they enter a facility, um, that means that the only personal protective equipment that's required for janitorial staff is going to be that which is required by the disinfectant itself. So your normal um, coverall gear or other sort of gowns or apron, whatever else you use, your your, your work daily cleaning um, equipment, as well as uh, gloves, disposable gloves if possible, but um, reusable gloves otherwise. We're not suggesting any COVID specific PPE cleaners because of the fact that with our guidance, we're allowing for this time period for the virus to get out of the air so the janitorial staff do not need to be worried about coming into the virus um, through their nose or mouth. Again, after all of this cleaning, as uh, Catherine mentioned, please emphasize also hand hygiene throughout this, especially after finished cleaning. Um, and then after that cleaning process, we feel like the um, area should be safe to reopen um, to everyone. But that's sort of the main guidance we want to uh, communicate and uh, across to you as uh, staff and managers of these libraries and of these community facilities in terms of cleaning and disinfection. Great, so shall we move to uh, questions now? That sounds good, Crosby. Sounds good. Okay, um, so uh, Dr. Brendis, uh, one question that occurs to me and I imagine has occurred to a lot of librarians as you were speaking there towards the end uh, is uh, you're not being worried uh, about paper-based products. Uh, some of us have read, it's been published in uh, various locations, because I've, I've seen it in more than one, uh, that the, the virus could exist for as long as 24 hours 
uh, on paper, on 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 or in uh, a book. I, I read you. Uh, I, I hear what you have to say as being uh, counter to that. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, a little bit more about how long the virus lasts, uh, or or if it's just so weak on uh, paper that we shouldn't be concerned about it? Sure. Yeah. So the survival um, is so there has been a study that was published that showed that survival of the virus on porous surfaces like cardboard lasted for up to 24 hours. Um, however, that was under sort of ideal lab conditions um, is one point to emphasize. And also, um, we don't know anything about then the virus's ability to then get back out of that surface and onto your hands or onto uh, for you to come into contact with it in some way. So we're much more concerned about the, the hard, non-porous surfaces that are high touch because uh, the virus survives longer on them, but also because it's much easier for your hands to uh, to get, get become contaminated with it after touching uh, one of those surfaces. So additionally, the only additional point I'll make also is that just in terms of the amount that an infected person is, um, is a virus that an infected person is shedding, um, we really believe that that would be that that shedding is going to be highest if an individual is symptomatic and coughing. So, really, for the, us to have been concerned about uh, transmission from any sort of paper-based material, the individual would have really had to cough or sneeze directly on the object, and um, you know, really have contaminated it. The sort of regular use by individuals and hope that hopefully no one is really sneezing into your books and things like that um, does not really concern us from that standpoint. So I, I th you know, I think I'm, I'm sure I speak for librarians and probably for museum folks too who have some paper-based materials. We're pretty sure that with some regularity, uh, the, the people are sneezing uh, onto our books. Of course, the question would be how how recently they've sneezed. Do they sneeze on it right before they they return it in the Dropbox or to the desk? If yeah. there is concern among librarians, which there is, uh, about that that particular circumstance that uh, an infected person can have discharged uh, in one way or another uh, onto a material onto a a book or a DVD or whatever it, it might be. Uh, what would you recommend if that is the concern? What what is safe handling of that? Should should uh, if if there is a 24 hour under ideal uh, conditions uh, possibility of the of the virus sustaining, should the books be quarantined for a day before they uh, uh, they're uh, uh, brought into human contact? So I would say um, that one part of this would be on the front end, um, educating your uh, educating your consumers, uh, reminding them, as Catherine said, about um, good hand hygiene, about symptom monitoring, trying to make sure that people um, are not uh, are not going out when they're sick and that they're staying home. Um, but also, then, if you are concerned, you could um, you could if you're very concerned about about books in particular, you could leave them for a 24-hour period. Um, again, only if you're really concerned that someone was was symptomatic um, with them uh, during that during the period that they had the book. I would also say that for um, DVDs or other materials that are more easily cleaned, um, DVDs may have those uh, sort of plastic covers, things like that. Those are pretty easily wipeable with alcohol wipes. So if there is something appropriate for it, um, or I know in a previous conversation, we also had um, questions around um, books that had plastic uh, or books that had Braille and had plastic sort of coatings or so. Those types of services are going to be more easy to disinfect and clean using, for example, an alcohol wipe of some sort. So that would be another way to uh, to deal with those other types of materials. Right. Um, and then in terms of uh, the disinfectants, uh, you've mainly been talking about uh, alcohol-based disinfectants, and uh, there are a lot of materials, particularly uh, uh, some uh, uh, paper materials that uh, don't react well to alcohol-based uh, disinfectants. On, on the CDC website or 
in other places are are there lists of disinfectants that uh, are non-alcohol based and that would be more appropriate for for paper based materials? So the our, our website links to um, the EPA who it's really the EPA's purview to uh, to list out the um, cleaners and disinfectants that have met the criteria for um, effectiveness against this virus. So that's that EPA list N that I was referring to. Okay, um, great. Cleaners and disinfectants are primarily, uh, the majority of them are, are meant for um, hard non-porous surfaces again. So that's part of why, um, but that, that's also because that's what they're designed for. That's where most of the disinfection concerns are. Um, there are some, I believe, that are appropriate for some porous soft materials, but it's more like fabrics um, and less like paper. So again, um, you know, main principle being we're not very concerned about the virus getting out of the book uh, or out of any sort of paper materials or things like that. If you were really concerned, you could wait for a 24-hour period uh, in between lendings if that was, if you were particularly in an area of very high transmission, for example. Right. Um, so the, the safest thing would, would simply be to, to, to wait for a day. Um, so uh, another question is, has been asked, um, uh, a lot of libraries have uh, 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 sensitive air handling, which you referred to before. Uh, uh, ozone systems, does the CDC have a view of uh, ozone systems, air purifying uh, systems on top of the normal uh, HVAC kind of air handling uh, systems uh, as to uh, whether that not they uh, offer some form of environmental protection? Um, we don't at this point. Again, the EPA are uh, the folks who sort of it's their purview to um, regulate and make a decision on what's effective and what's not effective. Um, I do know that some of the ozonators are um, have been used, I believe, um, uh, but I would have to check the EPA list to see to ensure that they're on that list. Um, we have had have been asked about that a few times, and our main uh, the main kind of caveat I would add is that we want to make sure that if people are going to use those systems, they're using them properly and they know how to use them. Um, so that's that would also be a reason why you may not see it appear on our community page because we might not. Um, suggest something super complex for the, the general public. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, the, the, generally speaking, uh, the, uh, the 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 time period for the uh, the, the crisis. Uh, this is, uh, I think, a, a probably a question you can't uh, can't very specifically answer. But um, we're, we're getting guidance over. Uh, this is for the, I guess, the the length of time people need to prepare for the emergency res, uh, response. Um, uh, we're being we're being uh, uh, told now that we've got a, a 30 day, another 30 days until the uh, the possible end of the of the crisis. It, from a material point of view, uh, from a, a, a general public health point of view, the the, the guidance around. Uh, six feet of distance, et cetera. Does that extend to the, this 30-day uh, period or will it extend beyond? So I think it's reasonable to expect that even as places open up and people get out into their community more, that there's going to be need for continued social distancing for some period of time. Now, what that period of time is, is gonna be a question that is probably best answered by some of the local health officials in your own community. We know that different communities currently are in different stages of sort of, or levels of community spread, and that will likely continue to be the case. So it will be really important to work with your local health officials to think about the strategies that are best used in your own facility and community. I do think it's appropriate to plan for social distancing for a more extended period of time, um, just to make sure that we're protecting staff and employees as best as we can. How extended it is, that, that's gonna be a question that your health officials can help you with. Okay, great. Um, and a very specific question that we've been asked is about uh, electrostatics uh, spray. 
uh, you know, as opposed to the normal disinfectants? Is that another question where we should go to the EPA, or do you have uh, uh, a view of that? Is that is that uh, uh, something that could be used by museums and libraries? I know that there are some sprayers on the EPA list end because we have had had a few questions on that. So they're listed as as effective disinfectants. Um, I don't know if those particular brands or products are, but there certainly are some spray based materials that are on that that list end. I want to say there are about 250 or maybe even 300 products on that list by now. Okay, great. Well, we'll we'll certainly link to the uh, to to the EPA on on our site once we get that up and running. Um, and then th this is a fairly specific question uh, as well. I think I know the answer, but uh, it's been asked and uh, it'd be great to get an answer from you. Are there anything, any uh, particular things we should be looking for uh, from uh, materials that might come from outside the United States, uh, either either uh, things we might pick up from vendors or, uh, or, or materials that uh, uh, come through uh, uh, international? Uh, lending. Um, again, in terms of any materials that are coming in, um, best practices are uh, you are practicing good hand hygiene if you're the person receiving the materials. Um, and then uh, if you're very concerned, you know, you could let it sit for, uh, for a 24 hour period or so. But um, that's, again, not, not in our concern. We haven't been concerned at all about people um, shipping packages uh, internationally or things like that, um, just because the virus is going to be very unlikely to survive for that long of a period through shipment and everything else and get to you in an infectious state um, of being. But if you're very concerned, again, practice good hand hygiene um, in those settings. Have alcohol-based hand sanitizers with at least 60% alcohol and hand washing with soap and water available to the employees that are doing the receiving so they can practice it while they're doing that receiving and also have them avoid touching their nose mouth uh, during that time. Great, thank you. Um, and, and then uh, one other fairly specific question, but a lot of museums and libraries uh, have uh, restaurants or cafes uh, inside. Is there any, any more specific guidance than the general guidance you've given us that uh, one would need uh, closing down or uh, uh, re-establishing re, uh, the activities uh, of uh, cafe, uh, any food service uh, in a museum or library? Yeah, no, we'd really, um, there's nothing uh, essentially uh, COVID-19 specific, but we would refer those food services to um, local food code and sort of best practices for management in terms of shutting down normal shutdown procedures, flushing of um, water-based systems and pipes, things like that, and then following their proper procedures for coming online um, just to avoid um, any other potential, you know, risks that come from leaving your pipes uh, and other uh, materials um, unattended for, you know, a few weeks on end. Um, it also wouldn't be a bad idea to, you know, just do another um, cleaning and disinfection of surfaces before you start and reopen. Great. Um, and then I've got one one other question that you probably, uh, in a way, already answered, but it's fairly specific. So um, I'll, I'll ask it, and I'll ask it in, in two two parts to it. Uh, Wi-Fi is available outside of many uh, libraries and and even to some extent museums, um, and uh, and also libraries and and museums. Uh, uh, encounter various groups who hang out uh, in the library or even hang out on the outside of uh, the library, uh, sometimes uh, homeless or uh, uh, shelter populations, et cetera. Is there any specific guidance you, you might have if that is the case for, uh, for a library or museum? I, I, people who might, it, groups that might have a higher uh, 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 level of uh, act, uh, encountering the infection. Yeah, so I would say in general, you want to think about the same things for the outside of some of the same things for the outside of your space as the inside. So I mentioned earlier the idea of posting some reminders and sort of visual prompts to help people remember those preventive actions and things like keeping uh, six feet away from people who aren't in their same household. You could put stuff like that outside of your facility as well. 
Um, right. We've seen examples in other settings where if, let's say there's an area where you have tables or benches or something like that, you could go ahead and space those out potentially so that they are a more appropriate distance from each other. Have those visual reminders. All those things are uh, appropriate to try. If there are specific populations, like you just mentioned, specifically homeless individuals, um, you may find some more of our guidance documents helpful for thinking about those groups. So for example, we do have some guidance related specifically to homeless individuals. But again, I would encourage you to reach out to your local health officials and talk through any specific situation that you're dealing with at your facility or in your community um, so that you can plan together on how to best respond. Okay, great. Um, so that that I run through the questions that we got before the uh, the webinar, uh, Scott or uh, Nancy. Do you have some questions that have come in during? Yes, indeed, uh, Crosby. Um, everyone is quite anxious to to have some questions answered. Um, one of them is, how about a UV light as a disinfectant? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I'd again refer to uh, EPA's list um, for guidance for um, disinfectants. And we do know that uh, UV, since it's a device, may not be on there, um, but we have seen um, UV disinfection used in a couple of different places um, and believe that it should be effective. But again, um, EPA and others may have more guidance on that, but um, make sure that you're using it with the proper uh, materials that it's appropriate for. Okay, thank you. Um, another question comes uh, regarding the volume of materials. And so it, uh, the question is that my library is unable to wipe down all DVDs and other Mylar book covers with hard services for these items. Would a 24 hour quarantine be enough time to take the, to make these materials safe or should we wait longer uh, to make it safe for staff or patrons to touch it with their hands. Um, if you're, if you're, so again, I want to reiterate that you know under these, uh, even under sort of the current um, time period of transmission, um, unless you know someone was very visibly ill with a product or so, um, paper-based product, we're not really concerned about um, that paper-based book or so being a transmission route. Um, however, if you were concerned about the book uh, being being having some, some of the virus on it, you could leave it aside for um, an up to 24 hour uh, period, which should be uh, sufficient for that. Um, for the DVDs or other or other products, if you're not um, wiping them down, again, a 24 hour period um, should be fine. Um, if you're very concerned, you can leave it for up to 48 hours, but 24 hours should be more than sufficient, um, just based on the fact that, again, uh, for a lot of these surfaces, um, an incidental contact from someone is not going to be a very high transmission risk. It's going to be if someone was very sick on the material um, and had, it shed a lot of virus on it that it would be of concern. Thank you, David. Uh, another question comes in uh, asking about a uh, a disinfectant other than alcohol-based being um, benzalkanonium chloride uh, or BAK. Is something like that ac acceptable? Yeah. So the EPA. So benzalkanonium chloride um, as a dis as a surface disinfectant is one of the quaternary ammonium compounds, and that's um, there are several quaternary ammonium compounds that are listed on uh, that EPA list. So you'd have to refer to that list in terms of the different formulations and what's effective there. Okay, thank you. Um, this one is result uh, is one of the practical matters for libraries. Uh, quite often, their book drops um, uh, either are full or are locked. And so people end up and leave them sitting outside. Um, and so in order to avoid an unsightly situation, um, staff will bring them into the building. Um, is there a recommendation as to how staff may do that in a safe manner? Again, I think we would just um, emphasize that the staff practice good hand hygiene um, after it, touching the books. Um, 
if they're concerned at all. So make sure they wash their hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds or use an alcohol-based sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol. Okay, thank you. I'm scrolling through the uh, large number of questions here. Bear with me one moment. Validating that you did include cardboard with the paper-based products in your recommendation, correct? Yes. Okay. It, it appears that the vast majority of the questions are similar. Let's see. Um, it says, if there is a shelter in place order in our state, would it be advisable to promote being outside to use Wi-Fi as long as we are posted at the six foot distance and other guidelines? Similar question to what Crosby asked. So I'm not totally sure about that. I've seen shelter in place um, guidance or orders I should say in, um, in different places that will often outline sort of what are essential services and I don't know that that would fall under an essential service for every place so I think looking at your specific language in the order for your community again talking with your local health officials would be pretty important um, I would say that would supersede the six foot thing um, recommendation. I would really talk with your local health officials to make sure that you have a clear understanding of what is and isn't allowed under a, a short shelter in place order. Thank you, Catherine. And I'd also add to that. I'd also add to that. Sorry that that um, that there that what Catherine's point earlier about getting in touch with your local officials early. Um, can help with uh, with getting on their radar, and if you feel like you're you're in a place where you want need to be an essential service because there's so many people who rely on your Wi-Fi for things or 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 any other public services, then the earlier you can open those lines of communication, the better off you're going to be. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Uh, I've got a question. It says some libraries have warming tents that deal with bed bugs as a way to eliminate bed bugs they heat things up pretty high so would that potentially be good use for materials that have been exposed um without knowing the specifics i'm not familiar with those so um that sounds like an ingenious technique and i'm not, um i don't know that i could comment on the specifics of it but um we do know that the the virus uh doesn't tend to like being in hotter environments um but again without looking at the specifics i couldn't comment on that specific equipment okay thank you um I think people are quite anxious about the 24-hour uh, quarantine, if it's enough for a safe circulation of library materials. Um, is there a potential to uh, perhaps restate that, sir? Yes. Um, so, again, yeah, the 24 hours, and I want to emphasize, is if you're very concerned about someone having gotten a lot of virus on a material, I'm talking about someone having coughed visible mucus large amounts of gross material on it that would be of concern um, we're giving uh, we're, we're more concerned about transmission through uh, through people being in close contact with each other number one so being within six feet of each other which is why we have the physical distancing and then after that um, with contact with frequently touched surfaces, like uh, doorknobs and railings and light switches and faucets and things like that. Sort of after all of those come uh, other materials that people touch, but not as frequently or the porous materials. Um, again, the uh, bad news is that, you know, those we know those are harder to disinfect. So your only options may be if you're very concerned to leave them. But the good news is that those materials don't tend to retain as much virus and if they do retain virus it's very hard to get them out of out of there and so they're not really going to be a transmission risk again we're not concerned about you know 
people doing mail-in ballots in states like Washington State when they were under high transmission orders uh, or high transmission magnitude, and we aren't concerned about cardboard materials as well. Um, so I want to just emphasize that um, you know the maybe uh, the 24 hours is a only if you're exceedingly concerned under the most um, certain conditions you can undertake that. I totally hear everyone's everyone's concern, but I do want to make sure that we sort of reprioritize what we know is the most important transmission pathways, which is respiratory close contact with people, followed by uh, touching, frequently touched surfaces, and then after that come the porous materials. All right, thank you, David. Uh, there's some general concern. Uh, I guess in the media, there's been a lot of, about the virus's ability to become airborne from clothes when shaken and moved around. Um, and it may be a concern with library materials as well. And so, um, do you recommend uh, personnel wearing masks um, while during or and during the disinfectant process? No. So if this is um, again, if this is after in terms of uh, after contact or after you've had some sort of case in in the area, um, we're not uh, that 24 hour period. Um, is going to uh, get the virus out of the air so that you can walk around that space and clean it safely. Um, then, of course, when you're doing the laundry, we do recommend not to shake it so as not to have the potential to aerosolize virus anymore. But uh, no, there's no sort of recommendation around mask uh, as PPE um, during laundry. We would only say that you make sure that you uh, clean your hands well after uh, handling any laundry that um, had contact with someone with COVID-19. Okay, thank you. And then uh, what about shoes? Uh, there's concern that the virus can be transported uh, into a space on someone's shoes. Again, um, we're thinking about high touch surfaces. Um, and so, uh, we're not thinking about or concerned at this point about um, even if a virus was on shoes and got into uh, an area, it would it wouldn't probably last very long um, in that area, and there wouldn't be enough of it to get people sick. And there would be very few people who are coming into contact with um, that particular with the floor in that area. So doesn't uh, doesn't occur to us as a very high uh, likelihood of transmission and um, in other settings, for example, in public spaces, we're not suggesting um, disinfecting of sidewalks, things like that. I know everyone's seen the pictures of everyone wearing uh, all sorts of crazy PPE and spraying chlorine on sidewalks. We are not recommending that by any means. We're just saying in public spaces, clean your high touch surfaces, your railings, your metal tables, things like that. Um, but don't worry about the, the floor and the sidewalks themselves. Well, thank you, David. I appreciate that very much. Um, we're very close on to the end of time, and I simply want to uh, let everyone know that all of the questions that have come in, we will be following up with our CDC panelists to provide answers on the IMLS.gov website. Uh, Crosby, do you have any parting thoughts? Yeah, I, I want to reemphasize that this will be an ongoing uh, interaction we've got with the uh, with the CDC, and obviously we need to to uh, to generate some information from the EPA on on disinfectants for the special material needs uh, in libraries and 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 museums. So we'll keep that up, and you can come to our website. I know we'll be sharing information with the Department of Education and others their websites uh, as well. So I'd urge you to continue to, uh, to look for that information. Also, I, I think one of the messages is good communication to, your, to and from your community and particularly with your local health officials uh, is one of the, I think, the most important takeaways from uh, uh, today's webinar. And I, I want to say a, a, a big thank you to David Verandas, Dr. David Verandas, um, uh, uh, and to Dr. Catherine Raspberry. Uh, for uh, their participation uh, today. It's a, we're really grateful that you would spend the time with us and give us this important information. And thank you all out there for the work that you're doing. And I think we're done. Thank, thank you. you that much. concludes our webinar. Thank you, everybody.